All right, you guys know what to do. Please welcome Kane and JBL. Give it up. Welcome. I had to come out with a mayor of Knox County to get a pop, but hell yeah, I did. <laughs> it's like Vince McMahon walked out with a rock one time, and the rock was absolutely on fire. And right before they walked out, he told the rock, he goes, listen to this pop. Of course, it was all for the rock, but this may all be for Kane, but I don't care. No. That's not what I'm telling no, my wife. What, what a great, this is a great crowd. Yeah. Tremendous. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. It's great to have you. Thank you. You guys want to get to some questions, hang out, whatever you're good. Just make the questions easy and non-controversial, please. Gotcha. Who's got a question? Raise your hand. Let's get this rocking. Right down front. And by the way, welcome. Thank you. Uh, congrats on the Hall of Fame for both of you. Um, you've had the who's who opponents. Who has been your favorite and who currently would you want to wrestle? To me or to Glenn? Both. both. Sure. My, my, my favorite was, was Kane. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I was really lucky to be around from, from the days of, you know, Hogan and the Warrior all the way up to, you know, through Cena and uh, to the start of Roman Reigns. So I got to wrestle, you know, the, the, the guy, all the good guys in the business and was thrilled with all of it. There's so many that it's, it's, too, it's hard to mention. Who I'd want to wrestle now? Roman Reigns. I don't think there's any doubt I, that, who that's who I would choose. Yeah, in the same way, that's a really hard question because you're going to leave someone out, you know, and they're I'm just, just like John, everybody from, you know, Hogan uh, on forward. I, I have had the opportunity to, you know, work with some people like Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins and others. Um, and again, it, it's, um, that's really hard. Ro Roman's great. Um, I always really enjoyed uh, Seth, though, because he's one of those guys that can do anything. Uh, he's a great ring general, and um, he can modify what he's doing. Like, he could have just as good a match with me uh, as far as making me look good um, as he could with anyone else, despite the fact that I was, you know, biggest person that he would wrestle. Uh, so, again, those are, that, those are really hard. They're, it's a good question, but it's really hard to answer. There's a lot of folks out there. All right, let's keep it going. Next, right over here. What was your favorite belt that you had? So my favorite belt. <laughs> and actually, they're called titles, and you will get in trouble if you don't say titles with Vince. <laughs> my favorite belt was the Hardcore Championship, all right? And the reason is because one time I'm going through TSA security at the airport, right? And I have the belt in my bag. And normally you would, you would take it out so you'd go through the metal detector, you know, they'd pull it out. But I forgot and I left it in the bag. So the TSA agent opens my bag, he looks at the hardcore title, and then he looks at me and he says, and he is serious, he says, you know it's broken, right? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the point, dude. Big boss man got the hardcore title, and Bob Hawley hit him over the head with so many different things that night. He walked into Vince's office and gave it back to him. <laughs> True story. True story. Got a question over here to the to the right. Or that way. Kane, how much time did it take you to master that hook that you used on your movie? How many times did? <laughs> uh, no, that, how that, much that, time? Yeah, how many times did, or how much time did it take to master uh, throwing of the hook in the movie? Um, so there were there were actually two versions of the hook. You had the real thing, which was pretty heavy, and then you had like um, a resin, which was a lot lighter, which was actually threw at people. I never mastered it uh, because it was it was pretty difficult, and we didn't have weeks for me to actually practice. So what you see in the movie is uh, was basically with CGI you know, and throwing it, but it made it look really good. So all I had to master was that, and then computers took over with the rest. Great question. Though. You right. think Alan, Alec Baldwin had problems on the set with people getting hurt? You should have been on camera. What, too soon? Oh, what? What? Wow. Oh, boo. Boo. I'm a heel. I hate when you boo me. All right. We'll move over here for another question. I said to keep it non-controversial, John. 
Um, Kane, how does it feel to be part of the Scooby Doo gang now? How's it? Uh, so, well, one of, one of the highlights of, of my career was the fact that I was in a Scooby Doo movie, right? <laughs> no, seriously. You know, seriously, because people know I'm in a Scooby Doo. I like little kids know Kane from a Scooby Doo movie. Um, so, anytime that you can do anything under the Scooby Doo brand, that is pretty dad gum cool. I, I got a question for you. Uh, Kane, when you were wrestling in Smoky Mountain promotion, you went under the name Unibomb. So, who, who thought that up? Who's, who's, uh, that, creative that, decision was that? That, was that? was Jim Cornette, um, yeah. because he, he liked, he just thought it was a cool name. So, of course, yeah, of course he did. <laughs> yeah. If you've ever met Jim Cornette, you will understand why that, why that, and why John's laughing right now. <laughs> Was Charles Manson taken? Why were you the... <laughs> All right, next question. What do we got? Raise him up over there. Right there. Let me get in there. Hi, guys. Um, what was your favorite on-the-road memory? Both. That you can share. That you can share. You know, it's fun. <laughs> I, I, don't rem I don't remember the 80s or 90s. <laughs> I was told they were freaking awesome, and I had a good time. <laughs> so my favorite on-the-road memory, one of them. It's one time me and Paul Bear are driving, I forget where, for, it might have been Pittsburgh, actually, and we're driving to Huntington, West Virginia. All right, and we're going along, and you have to understand uh, who Paul's personality. Okay, Paul's a, Paul has a heart of gold, but it's buried pretty deep behind some serious curmudgeon that's in there. Right, so we're driving along, and we're just driving on the interstate. We're driving and driving, and then all of a sudden, the car just bam and just lurches forward. Okay, and Paul is like looking around and looks in the rearview mirror. Another car had hit us. Um, and bumped us, not that hard, but enough. And I look in the rear view mirror and I see this guy in the other car like, woo! <laughs> Meanwhile, Paul says some things I can't, I mean, I turn, I turn like, I blush with what Paul was, uh, Paul was saying. But yeah, that was the, the lesson, never get ahead of, of the, uh, uh, the APA when they were in a hurry to get to a show. It was a mistake. I just uh, bumped into him. I didn't know. And there's Paul Bear. Woo! <laughs> All right. What's next? Right here. This is for you, John. Um, so all the epic bar scenes, do you have a favorite moment? And did you really tear up the bar like as planned, or did you guys go over the top in some things? You know, we, we, we always had to do those in one shoot because guys got busted open. Uh, you know, things got broken, guys would get busted open, so we had to do it in one take. So it was always uh, taped earlier in the day, but it was live to the camera. So one time I grabbed a bull Buchanan, and I was going to throw him through a gimmicked wall. And as I grabbed him, he goes, wrong wall, wrong wall. <laughs> Sorry, brother. <laughs> Thank God he didn't get too mad at me. But, yeah, we, we, we had – it was unbelievable. I one time got a pull cue all the way through my face. Uh, Val Venus had hit me on the shoulder – and it wrapped around, and it's right here. It, it went all the way through my cheek. I stick my, my tongue out my cheek, and the camera missed every bit of it. And it wasn't on camera at all. I grabbed the uh, Sweaty, the cameraman. I grabbed him. We call him Sweaty. And I grabbed his ankle to let him know I was down there. And he looked down and just kept filming and walked out, and I missed it. <laughs> it was in St. Louis. I went in, and I got plastic surgery at the building and then had to wrestle in the main event that night. with <laughs> So... So uh, t tell them t about Tim White and the, yeah, t yeah, the Friendly Tap. The Friendly Tap was Tim White's bar up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. Wonderful place. And so he, had, he and Andre were best friends. Arnie Scollin were best friends. I mean, it was like a hall of fame of pictures and all this stuff. When you'd walk in, though, you'd see pictures of uh, Kane and JBL because he would take Andre's picture down and put yours in the very front. And go, Tim, come on, I'm not buying this. But when we tore up his bar... Tim had all these nanotube televisions up on the, the wall, and we come back, and Vince had had to buy him a flat-screen HD televisions. And Vince was so mad. He goes, 
I didn't know I was rebuilding his entire <laughs> damn yeah. bar. Yeah. They, they'd break like the pool table, and he'd send Vince a, a, an invoice for $15,000. <laughs> and then you go in, and the friendly tap had been completely renovated every, <laughs> every time they'd have a bar fight there. Yeah. <laughs> Got a question for you right down here. Actually, a two-part question for both gentlemen. Um, I read a lot of interviews, and you hear about wrestlers that uh, will talk about the, uh, the wrestlers that inspired them to pursue the uh, industry. So first part is, uh, for each of you gentlemen, who uh, specifically maybe uh, helped inspire you to pursue wrestling as a career? And also, once you started your careers, was there any veterans that took you under their wing to help, help you learn the business and help you grow in the industry? When I was uh, growing up, we lived out in the country, didn't have cable TV, so we saw all-star wrestling out of Kansas City. And it was people like um, Ray Candy and Bulldog Bob Brown and Bruiser Bob Sweetan. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, if you're not from that area or had never seen uh, them, you wouldn't be familiar uh, with who they are. Um, then, like once a month, we'd go down to my grandmother's who lived in St. Louis and... Uh, at that time, wrestling at the Chase was the biggest show in the country. Uh, so I'd get to see, you know, like um, Devon Ericks and, you know, uh, it was a little before Flair, but Harley Race and, and all those guys. So for me, at that point, it really wasn't one specific uh, person. It was just, man, I was like, this is, you know, this is really cool. And then by the time that I got to uh, college, of course, was that was the height of Hulkamania. And, you know, it, that, that was, we forget just like in the Attitude Era um, of how big that was. It wasn't just like wrestling was hot. It was like wrestling was the biggest thing in entertainment. Um, so it wasn't, for me, it wasn't one person that really uh, inspired me. It was just being like, man, how cool is that? That you could go out and, you know, have tens of thousands of people um, reacting, cheering or whatever uh, for you. Uh, the person that took me out of the morning was Undertaker from, you know, from uh, early on in my career. Um, my first match with him, was actually bef with him was actually before WWF. It was in uh, 1995 uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, actually, uh, at the Civic Coliseum working for Smoking Mountain Wrestling. And um, that was probably one of the most important matches of my life because I think that I proved to him, hey, I could physically match up with The Undertaker. Um, so he helped me throughout my career, not only once I became Kane, uh, but much earlier than that. And, and probably the reason I became Kane was because he was always there advocating for me. My uh, influence is growing up. I, got, I was in West Texas, so I got the TV between uh, the Funks and Amarillo and the Von Erics in Dallas. So those are my two idols growing up. I, I just watched that KTV, uh, KTVT Channel 11 every single Saturday night with my grandfather and the Von Erics. Just uh, I was, that's all what I always wanted to do. And my first big influence, I'd gotten to Japan after just a few weeks in the business, which probably shouldn't have happened. But uh, Bob Orton uh, Jr. took me under his wing, Randy's dad. And we tagged for five, six weeks over there, a couple different tours. And he really helped me a lot. He knew that was over my head in Japan. And he, he really helped me a, a, a ton. Got a question right down here. What were your thoughts on the Isaac Yankum? Uh, was that Jerry Lawler's idea? <laughs> if it was, I wouldn't talk to him to this day, actually. <laughs> no, um, so uh, I had had a tryout with WWE, and it went really well, and uh, knew that, you know, knew that I was going to sign a contract with them, and uh, went, flew from Knoxville to New York City and got picked up, and I was really, you know, got picked up in a limousine to get taken over to uh, Titan Towers in, in Stanford, Connecticut. And I'm on top of the world because I'm a WWE superstar. It's going to be awesome. And then Vince tells me about this uh, wrestling dentist. And at first I thought he was joking. He wasn't joking. Um, so I was like, man, you know, this is uh, – I was not really thrilled about it. Um, but, you know, looking back, that was how I got my foot in the door. And um, – that led to some other great opportunities for me. Uh, it was actually, from what I understand, uh, Bruce Pritchard had told, has told me that was Bobby Heenan's idea. And it didn't have anything to do with me, just Bobby Heenan had this idea for a wrestling dentist, and that's where Vince picked it up from. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what uh, Bruce told me. All right, we're over here on the right-hand side. Got a question for you. What was your biggest challenger in wrestling? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, the biggest challenge I had was I thought I was done. I, I'd had bicep surgery. I'd had two hernia surgeries and I thought I was finished wrestling. And Vince McMahon called me and said, we need somebody in six weeks to face Eddie Guerrero at the Staples Center in the main event. And I really thought I was probably retired at that point because of injuries. And it was a real uphill battle. Uh, I didn't know if it was going to get over. I didn't know if it was going to work. Thank God it was Eddie Guerrero. And he and his brother Chavo came up with the idea of having his mother have a heart attack uh, in El Paso on Mother's Day. And after that footage aired, uh, you could tell that the character took a different dimension and got over. We ended up having a record, uh, a ticket sell record at the Staples Center at that time uh, with, with Eddie and I, uh, and mainly because of Eddie Guerrero. But if it hadn't been for Eddie, uh, JBL would have been a one-off, and I certainly wouldn't be here right now. I said I didn't know that. That's a, that's actually an amazing story. We were scared to death about the Staples Center that uh, we weren't going to be able to sell tickets. Uh, so many guys were hurt. You had Kurt Angle was hurt. Big Big Show was hurt. Brock had just left the company. That's why they needed the character of JBL to step up against Eddie Guerrero. But here was this guy who had been just a tag team guy most of his career, and before that, you know, characters that you know not remembered Blackjack Bradshaw and Justin Hawk Bradshaw, and all of a sudden you need this main event guy and. And it, and it didn't work. It didn't work for about two or three weeks until Eddie and Chavo, his Chavo, his brother, not his nephew, came up with the idea of the heart attack angle with his mother. For, for me, it's actually pretty uh, similar because, you know, I had the Isaac Ankem character and had the fake Diesel character. Um, and, you know, to, be, to overcome that and to be put in um, a very high level uh, was something – you know, when I was doing Isaac Ankham, I never would have imagined that. Um, so it's actually my, my story is very similar. And uh, with me, instead of uh, Eddie and Chavo, is you know, basically Undertaker uh, helping make that being successful. But very similar stories. It's an amazing thing. You know, in 95, uh, when I got to the WWE and Kane had been there just a little bit before me, uh, the, that was probably the best roster, in my opinion, in the history of wrestling. You know, maybe you can argue the, the Hogan era might, might be – equal or better you know it's, it's hard to say when you're comparing different generations but that was to me the greatest roster ever it's just guys were in wrong characters you know you had triple h you had stone cold uh, you had uh, isaac yankum you had all these guys you had the nwo that weren't being used you had all these guys but they were just in different characters got a question over here by the wall Thank you guys for being here and sharing your experiences. Uh, my question is this. Do you, throughout your career, do you believe that you identified more as actors or do you identify more as athletes? Um, I think there's a kind of a combination uh, of both throughout your careers. And I just wonder when you're training, because I know it's very physical, where, like if you're putting it on a resume, which, which way do you go with that? Oh, I think I'm like Usain Bolt. I'm an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who I am. Then. <laughs> um, that, that's actually a great question. And for me, and, and probably Undertaker too, um, we're unique because we're characters. Okay? Um, for a lot of the other WWE performers, it's their personality turned up way up through an 11. But for us, it's we're actually playing these characters. Um, so for me, like the matches, I was an athlete, but the promos and stuff, I was an actor. Um, so I, I don't know which. I, I would probably actually identify a little more as an, as an actor um, than I would. An, and I certainly ain't Usain Bolt. So, but I would probably identify a little more as an actor than an athlete. I'm more like Ursula Bolt. That's his <laughs> big fat cousin. <laughs> That was, was in a bowling league. Yeah. All right, I've got a question right here. Hey, guys. Um, I'm friends with Drew Hankinson, who played imposter Kane a while back, was with the WWE for a while. He would describe instances of Vince McMahon backstage ripping into wrestlers over mistakes. Can you name or have a, a, a story to tell over the biggest incident you got ripped into by Vince backstage? He actually... Uh... I never really got that that much um, because he Vince would more direct um, direct his criticism at the people producing the matches. 
okay? Because he didn't, he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to jump on the performers, all right? Um, so I never really got that that, that much. Uh, in Drew's case, it's kind of funny uh, because they had that short-lived, uh, the, the short-lived Kane thing, right? That, that he was the imposter Kane. And what happened, <laughs> what happened was, uh, he always, isn't it like when, when someone tells a story and you know this is not a true story, because they say what happened was, this is a true story. Um, but in any case, man, so I, I, I say, yeah, to, to tell you the truth, to tell you the truth. Um, so I'd, I'd gone down and seen like Drew's outfit and stuff, and we kind of worked a little bit together before he debuted as that uh, down uh, in uh, where NXT was at the time in, in Georgia. And it w- he's wearing this wig, and it was like a synthetic hair wig, and it was terrible. And I was like, I remember calling, I think, I think when Johnny Laurinaitis or someone saying, it's great, but the wig's got to go, okay? The wig looks just fake as all get out. They didn't switch the wig. And there he is on live TV with this frizzy hair, and Vince went ballistic. Not at him, but at the fact that, you know, the thing looks silly. Um, and that, that was actually why that whole thing was ditched was because, you know, Vince thought it made such a terrible impression. It actually made Kane, my character, look bad because here you have this person. <laughs> you had this guy with bad hair beating me up, basically. Um, but, you know, the imposter Kane, and he's, you can tell, you know, that, that, it was, uh, that it was very poorly done. It's funny because Vince has a level of respect for the boys and girls, I say boys in a generic term, uh, that he – that he doesn't, that he has, that makes him not do stuff like that. So Jerry Lawler always said, Vince never yelled at him on the headset. Vince has never yelled at me. Uh, and if, I think it's because I was in the ring for him so long. Same with Jerry. Now, as far as the play-by-play guys, that's different. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. We were sitting in the back one time with Vince, and we, Jimmy Snuka's son was debuting, and Vince said, uh, be sure when you say when he comes in that uh, it's Jimmy Snuka's son. Now, later we tried to say that, but then Vince goes on to say, last thing you want to say is he's Jimmy Snooker's son because he can't live up to the fact that Jimmy Snooker was his dad. Now, later they tried that because he wasn't really, you know, didn't really work out, and they tried. But Michael Cole took copious notes, so he's writing down Jimmy Snooker's son. I don't even notice it. As soon as the kid tags in, Michael Cole says, in comes Jimmy Snooker's son. Vince had just told him, don't say Jimmy Snooker's son. Well, when he says that, they've got that little God cam where they can look at us. I start laughing because I realize Cole doesn't know not to say that. Vince sees me laughing and thinks Cole is making fun of him in front of the entire company. Vince's response was, Michael, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to fire you. No, I'm going to come down there and I'm going to kick your ass. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And he's debating with himself at this point. He goes, no, these no. Guys are, you guys are still on commentary trying to call a match, this right? This is during a live show. And he goes, no, 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 no. I'm going to kick your ass. Then I'm going to fire you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm coming down right now. And Michael's just looking at the camera like, and I'm dying laughing, and there's no commentary. And then by the time the commercial comes around, there was no commentary in the match. Vince realizes what happened, that Michael did it by mistake. He goes, ha, oh, I lost it a little bit there, didn't I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Couple more questions up front here. All right, JBL, I got one question for you and Kane. So, JBL, what was the one funny moment that you and Michael Cole being on commentary, and then Kane, what was the one moment during your rivalry with The Undertaker? You know, the funny moment with Cole was was I think the funniest was the one with uh, Jimmy Snuka's son. But we had so many different times on commentary where they would do stuff to Michael Cole, but they wouldn't do it to me. You know, and I'd be in on it. Would Finley hit him with shillelagh? I mean, they, they abused Michael Cole for, for, for years. And thank God I just got part of it. They had Titus O'Neil throw up on him one time. Titus, Titus was supposed to drink this pea soup and spit the pea soup out on Cole. Well, Titus thought that he was supposed to drink it and actually throw up. Oh. A true story. So he drinks it and throws up on Cole. He actually threw up on him on live television. And Michael's out there with puke all over him. And he says, I feel like I'm in a freaking frat party back in college. And Vince goes, don't acknowledge it. Don't acknowledge it. Don't say a thing about it. Michael's like, I'm covered in puke. 
you had a guy puke on me and you don't want me to talk about it. Do you have a, a, a funny moment? I, I can't top that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that we were, there was like, most of our stuff was, it was actually, you know, we, we, were, we were moving so fast and everything was going along um, so fast that you know, I have a lot of funny stuff, but I can't really, like with me and Mark specifically, I don't really remember anything, you know, that's really, oh gosh, you know, that's hilarious to you. I'm sure you do, but nothing we can share at this audience. Uh, <laughs> we had one time, and I don't want to tell anybody who, who, who might have done this, Undertaker, but um, we were in Europe, and I was in the ring, and under, somebody, I'm not going to say who, it could have been his brother, uh, had an idea when Big Show came out, they would, oh, yeah. they would stop his music. I wasn't even there for that one, <laughs> yeah. And, and play Shrek's theme music. Oh, yeah. So I'm sitting in the ring with Kurt Angle in a triple threat match, and Kurt's not in on it. Somebody, the dead man, was back by the music uh, booth, you know, arranging it. And as Big Show hears the music, he like, starts listening around, and he turns red. It's like a giant red tomato, like a 540-pound red tomato. And Kurt Angle goes, what is that? And I go, Shrek's theme music. He goes, oh, my God, he's going to kill us. And I go... <laughs> Listen, I, it, I did it. I'm going to take the blame for it. He goes, oh, thank God. Big Show gets in the ring. I said, I swear to God, Kurt Angle did it, and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and I jumped down the ring. Well, yeah, with, with, actually, with Mark and I, most of it would be evolved around uh, Paul Bear. And, <laughs> yeah, just teasing Paul and just being uh, – he deserved every bit of it, okay? So it wasn't cruel because if he had the chance to do it first, he would. But most of it involved ribbing Paul Bear. At the end of the tour, we, we ribbed Big Show so many times, and he thank God he took it well because he's he's a true giant, and he would have ate me probably. Um, but at the end of it, they brought him the, the flight attendant brought him a, a little magazine, and he's talking to Undertaker, who's been who's behind all the ribs. I'm just getting blamed for it, and that's why he did them. And so he goes, I, I'm, I'm going to kill him. I'm just going to kill him. I'm going to kill John. He goes, I know it's just John being John. He goes, but I'm going to kill him. And the flight attendant says, sir, would you like this? And he goes, not right now. He goes, I'm sick of Bradshaw. I'm a giant, and he's messing with me, and I'm going to kill him. And Tigger's going, I don't blame you. And the flight attendant goes, sir, would you, would you like this? And he goes, what is it? And he grabs it, and it's a Shrek fun book. <laughs> And I'm sitting in the back of the plane, and there's one aisle, and I thought, you know what? I've got nowhere to go. He's going he's gonna to fucking kill me. And he gets it, and he starts r ripping it up. And then, he, then he looks at Taker, and he goes, okay, that's kind of funny. And I, Thank God. That's the reason I'm here today, because he's a good-spirited giant. He would always, I, was, I would always tell him, i go, let's go, Shrek. He goes, all right, donkey, we're off. Another question for you right here. So obviously you guys did a lot of acting with, uh, throughout your careers. Um, and I know you did a lot with Team Hell No. But was there ever a moment where you just were trying so hard not to break your characters? Like whether it was something funny or something that just made you very upset. What's like something that happened? At the end of every night, when when uh, during the run in 2004, 2005, I, I would after TV, I would go out there and I would do something, and Undertaker would come out and choke slam me and tombstone me and all that stuff for the live crowd, you know, to keep us. So every every night, I you know I got beat up by the Undertaker, and I always tried to get him to break character, and everybody would give me stuff throughout the entire day. Uh, Kevin Dunn, who's Vince's right hand guy, Vince McMahon would give me stuff. Everybody was in on it, trying to get the Undertaker to break character. I got him one time. And it, it made me laugh so much that finally he, he just choke slammed me and tombstone me, and that was it. He had gone on a, a vacation, and he had the, the, the camper he had rented had overheated. It was like 105 degrees. He said, I looked back there, and my dog was laying on the floor just panting. And his kids were, like, mad at him. So we get out there, and I said, you need to turn that frown upside down. You need to rent, like, a camper and go on a vacation. And at that point, he starts to laugh, and I laughed and got tombstoned. And that was it. <laughs> there is, um, it was, uh, we would do Sunday Night Heat, and it was a standalone show, so we would kind of do some matches and do Sunday Night Heat and you know, the two-hour show. And 
uh, afterwards you'd have a dark match and, and at that time we didn't really do dark matches we just it was just stuff people do promos and all this silly stuff um, and I can't remember if they've ever showed it or not but they had this thing uh, where it was me and I'm out there and Mick Foley and Austin and remember when you know the Godfather used to say pimping ain't easy right so they start coming up I mean it's just ridiculous like Mick is like I pulled my hamstring, and let me tell you, limping ain't easy. And then whatever it was, whatever it is, and then Austin. And Austin, and you can he's got that Texas accent, so you, I couldn't understand him half the time when he'd get into something. And he says, I was out fishing, and let me tell you, scrimping ain't easy. And they show the camera on me, and I'm still wearing the mask, like the full face mask, but everything's moving because I'm laughing so hard. And I'm just awesome out there. I'm going, you know, like, these are like, you know, the two like, baddest ass guys on the planet. And they're making up like fairy, you know, fairy tale rhymes or whatever. And it doesn't even rhyme anymore. They're just, you know, trying to do whatever. So for me, that was probably it. The best character break ever was Vader and Mankind. Uh, maybe Cactus Jack back in WCW. So Vader gets out there and he's doing his stuff. because I fear no man. I feel no pain. He's doing his stuff. Fear no man. I feel no pain. And Cactus hits him from behind with a shovel and it caught his elbow right on the edge. <laughs> and as he goes, I fear no man. He goes, ah, shit. <laughs> Live television, too. <laughs> Uh, we got time for one more question. Kane JBL, thanks for doing this. You're headed back to your table to sign and hang out for photos, but we got time for one more question. What a great q and A! If you didn't get a chance to ask your question, yes. go out and uh, see them at their tables, get a picture, get an autograph. All that good stuff. Here we go. Last question. Now, both of you guys have spent time as both faces and heels. Which did you prefer, and how much influence did you have in the direction your character went? Oh man, uh, bad guys, bad guys, so much more fun. Uh, it just is because you can you can do anything, and see as a baby face, you have certain parameters in which you have to operate. Okay, it's very clearly defined, you know. And this is you know you just can't do you can't do all the stuff that you can do as a bad guy. Um, plus, it's just not it's just cooler to have people uh, boo and hiss at you anyway. Um, so that's a, that's a lot more fun than, you know, I mean, frankly, the, the baby faces are boring. Um, but and as far as the, uh, again, I'm a little different because my character is actually a character. So to keep the integrity of the Kane character, you know, there are certain things it just ha had to do. Um, but it, the way I describe it is, you know, here's, here's the broad outline of the character. Here's kind of the broad brushes. And then I was the person that had to fill in the details of that. Um, so, you know, not necessarily having huge uh, input into the overall direction, but as far as ultimately making it work in a way that I can make it work, I was the person responsible for that. Hot Rod Roddy Piper, I asked him one day, I said, Hot Rod, I said, what happened to you the Carolinas? He goes, some idiot climbed to the ring with a knife, said he's going to stab me. I said, well, what happened? And he pulled up his shirt and he goes, well, he stabbed me. <laughs> I said, well, he, he said he's going to stab you. <laughs> I always liked being a heel. I was a rotten baby face. So uh, to me, uh, you know, they always, the old wrestling um, saying is, you want to have a good time, go out with the heels. Because <laughs> uh, we're the guys who had a lot of fun. The baby face is a bunch of prima donnas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. We, we had to carry them. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. JBL Kane, give it up. Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. And have fun, and follow your fandom.